Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular lesson is number 12 in a series on the Book of Acts. It's been a very interesting book. As you know, uh, the, the, the stories in Acts are amazing. This is the lesson for September 22 of 2018. And as always, we'd like you to bow your heads with us and join us in prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, as we study once again this very special book, the story of the early church and its history, help us to understand now these final events in the life of Paul. Um, may we see them clearly. May we understand what we are to learn here is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When we finished our last lesson, we had Paul being transferred by a secret m midnight group of soldiers, <laughs> foot soldiers and um, ho horseback soldiers, cavalry, from Jerusalem to avoid his being killed by, uh, on the following day by a group of people who were determined to, to do away with him. I always wonder when I read that story whether those people who swore we were going to, we're not, we're, we're not going to eat until we kill Paul. I wonder if they kept that promise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, so now we find Paul confined in the prison uh, at Caesarea Maritima. Caesarea Maritima was a beautiful palace that I had the privilege of visiting a couple of years ago. Um, not just a palace, a whole spread, a whole beautiful place on the, on the northern coast of, of Israel. Um, and it was built originally by uh, uh, Herod, uh, Herod the Great uh, as a memorial, sort of, to uh, Caesar Augustus, who had been so much, helped him so much in becoming a king of the Jews. So, and we're going to learn that Paul was stuck there for about two years, maybe even a little bit over two years. And what did he do during that time? Well, we know, the things we know about is that he gave, two, he gave three defenses. The first one before Felix, which happened almost immediately. Then quite some time later, uh, the Felix was taken away and Festus came and he gave a presentation before him. And then finally, a presentation before Festus and King Herod Agrippa, the second with his sister Bernice. Um, and technically, I guess we would say this was the fulfillment of the prophecy that had been given by Ananias back when Paul, Paul was first struck down by light and then he was taken into Damascus and he said, you will be called to testify before kings. Well, here's a king. And he testified before the king. Well, did Paul ever admit his guilt? No. He was absolutely adamant about his innocence. No evidence could be produced against him and no actual witnesses testified to any crime that he was supposed to have committed. So that, that should have just, you know, he should have been just let loose and go just like that. There shouldn't have been any further discussion because there were no witnesses. It was completely hearsay. The, the Jews' case against Paul was completely hearsay. Um, but what, why, didn't, why wasn't he allowed to go free? Well, the rulers it. were, or, you know, the, uh, the, Festus, Roman, Festus, the Roman governors. Yeah, the governors felt that maybe there might be something in it for them if you know, somebody could okay, bribe that them. Was, that that was, was one, and then the other one was they were, they, they didn't want to stir up the Jews. They wanted yeah. to keep things peaceful with the Jews, and so they just kept Paul so in prison. So it was a favor to the Jews, they kept Paul in prison. Yeah. Well, uh, and of course all the Christian friends from Jerusalem that had been responsible for getting him imprisoned rushed over there to help him, right? No. <laughs> no. No, no evidence, no. but... Uh, that, that's really sad. No evidence that any Christian leader from Jerusalem or any other part of Judea or Galilee went to try to help Paul during those years. But now he did have some people with him. Who was with him? Well, Luke, obviously, because Luke's writing this. Uh, particularly when once they leave mm -hmm. on the boat, he's it's yeah. in the first, you know, we and such. Mm -hmm. Well, 
We've talked about Paul's situation, how he's arrived in Jerusalem and first met with the Jewish Christian leaders and poured out all that money on the table in front of them. I mean, I, I try to imagine, I mean, these are gold coins in those days, probably, that most of it wasn't. Here it is, a huge batch of gold coins. And these people were hurting. And the churches, the, the Gentile churches in Achaia and Macedonia and probably Asia Minor had very generously uh, donated to support the, the brethren in Jerusalem. And uh, what was their response? Um, Gary? After the presentation of the gifts, Paul, quote, declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry, unquote. This recital of facts brought to the hearts of all, even of those who had been doubting, the conviction that the blessing of heaven had accompanied his labors. The men who, while numbered amongst those who were in charge of the work at Jerusalem, had urged that arbitrary measures of control be adopted, saw Paul's ministry in a new light and were convinced that their own course had been wrong. Okay, they, I'm going to interrupt there for just a second. The people in Jerusalem, when they realized Paul had been arrested, was in prison, been taken by the Romans, they knew that it was their fault. Okay? Go ahead. That they had been held in bondage by Jewish customs and traditions, and that the work of the gospel had been greatly hindered by their failure to recognize that the wall of petition between Jew and Gentile had been broken down by the death of Christ. At times they had erred in permitting the reports of his enemies to arouse their jealousy and prejudice. But instead of uniting in an effort to do justice to the one who had been injured, they gave him counsel which showed that they still cherished the feeling that Paul should be held largely responsible for the existing prejudice. I'm going to interrupt there for a second again. Now who are these people who are causing all this trouble? Leaders in Jerusalem. Yeah. Do we know any of them by name? James. Know. James, we know absolutely the older brother of Jesus was one of them. Who are the other leaders? John, the cousin of Jesus, probably. Anybody else? Peter. These are the people who are named elsewhere as, as the leaders in Jerusalem. But we read of them in other places. John is somewhere else later, and Peter is too. Did they, were they in Jerusalem at this time? Well, the reports we have of them being somewhere else was later. Mm -hmm. uh, no, of course, we had Peter coming up to uh, Antioch that time, and Paul rebuked him to his face. I don't know whether that led to his being. With, so, I mean, we don't know. I'm, I don't want to. Accuse he anybody. Was in, he was in Rome later. Yeah. Peter. Yes. And yeah. John was in. Okay, Jesus. Gary, sorry. They did not stand nobly in his defense, endeavoring to show the disaffected ones where they were wrong, but sought to effect a compromise by counseling him to pursue a course which, in their opinion, would remove all cause for misapprehension. Now, that came from Acts of the Apostles, page 402, paragraph 3 through 403, paragraph 1. So, let's, let's look, analyze that statement for a moment. They're asking Paul to risk his life to make their work easier. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and they might have also thought that he was in prison because maybe it wasn't exactly God's will. Or that he was taken captive yeah. for that reason. Yeah, I, I, the fact that it said, Ellen White says that they knew they were in the wrong. Um, at, at which point, though? Well, earlier, right in this, he already read it to us. Yeah. So, they realized that even before they realized that they were that their prejudices had gone in the wrong direction. Well, Paul is standing there beside them. Well, five days later, after Paul's transfer to Caesarea, a group of leading Jews, including the high priest and some members of the Sanhedrin, and a professional lawyer named Tertullus, went from Jerusalem to Caesarea Maritime and formally laid before Felix the case against the apostle. 
You can read about that in Acts 29, verses 1 to 9. This particular trial was unique in that it was the only trial uh, against Paul mentioned in the book of Acts in which a lawyer was employed. Tertullus tried to butter up Felix with a lot of lies about what a wonderful leader he was. In actual fact, Felix was repressive and violent, and there was enormous antagonism against him among the Jews. So uh, does it help to come and when you're trying to prove your case is correct to start out with a bunch of lies? Fairly typical of lawyers, isn't it? Sometimes. <laughs> well, no. It's, know, let's but, hope that's not <laughs> completely typical of lawyers. <laughs> well, Tertullus pressed three specific charges against Paul. One, that Paul was an agitator and was constantly fomenting unrest among Jews throughout the empire. Is that true? No. No. Who was fomenting the unrest? The Jews. The Jews, the Jews were fomenting the unrest against Paul. Two, that Paul was a ringleader among the sect of the Nazarenes. Is that true? Depends on what you mean by Nazarene, because, <laughs> well, you know, if you th Jesus was from Nazareth, so yeah. if he used it in that sense, well, yes, in, in a sense. And I guess it also depends on what you mean by ringleader. <laughs> right, because later in his defense, he, he doesn't refute that yeah. necessarily. He, he, he says that they that they called a sect, you know, uh, referring so to, to in, the in way, our, when yeah. he's talking about the way. In our day, uh, would he be called a gang leader if you were trying to put him down? He would characterize things in a negative way. Yes, implying that Christianity as a whole was an anti-government and disruptive movement. Is that true? No. Well, there's part of that is true. Yes. Because as far as the Roman government was concerned, so far, Christianity was an illegal religion. So in that sense, it was true. And three, that Paul himself had attempted to defile the temple in Jerusalem. Was that true? No. No, that was not. Okay. So basically, all three of these charges were, were false, weren't they? Well, in Acts 24, 10 through 21, as it goes on, uh, Paul recounted his to own journey as a believer. In the process, he made two absolutely telling points against Tertullus's arguments. One, the people who supposedly had seen Paul in the temple with the Gentile were nowhere to be found. Acts 24, 18 and 19. So why do you suppose that was? Because no one had seen them together. That's exactly right. There wasn't any evidence of that. No one had seen it. That was just This was hearsay. This was a, a rumor that was made up. That should have immediately rendered the, the trial invalid. Two, the, the rest of Tertullian's arguments were based on hearing a hearing before the Sanhedrin held a week earlier. Technically, those arguments were only what? Hearsay, hearsay evidence. <clears throat> what do we, how, how much weight is hearsay evidence supposed to have in a court? So the main argument was that Paul had claimed that there was a resurrection of the dead. What a terrible notion. No wonder the high priest himself and others of his associates from among the what group? Sadducees. The Sadducees were the ones who attended the trial. Why? No Pharisees attended because Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead. <laughs> wow. It just shows that this whole thing was, was you know, made up. Although we only have brief summaries of the statements of Tertullius and Paul, Felix recognized that the case against Paul was pretty flimsy. While we do not know how much Felix knew about Christianity, his wife Drusilla was Jewish. She must have known something and may have shared it with him. By the way, do we know what happened to Drusilla? No. She was preserved in the ashes at Pompeii. Really? She died at Pompeii. Really? Yep. So in, a, in effect, Felix said, I, I, I'm, I'm putting this, off, this trial off until a later date. Of course, he was hoping that Paul or some of Paul's friends would pay a large bribe to get him out of prison. And my question is, okay, so if someone comes along with a big bribe and lets Paul out of prison, now what's his excuse? Well, he got a big bribe, so I let him 
about what, what's he going to say if someone the Jews show up and argue with him? Oh, he escaped. I mean, what 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 would he say? He may be used to getting that bribe for other. Probably, probably. It's common knowledge that you could be bought. But what what do you say to well, your might, opponents? Well, he might say after con further consideration, I had decided that Paul was innocent and there was no the charges against him were false. I suppose that's also possible. I mean, people say whatever they can that seems reasonable. Yeah. Okay, well, carrying on the story, Fred? Yes, in uh, <coughs> Acts 24, 24 to 26, from the Good News translation of the Bible, we have the following. After some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he talked about faith in Christ Jesus. But as Paul went on discussing about goodness, self-control, and the coming day of judgment, Felix was afraid and said, You may leave now. I will call you again when I get the chance. <laughs> At the same time, uh, he was hoping that Paul would give him some money, and for this reason, he would often send for him and talk with him. Do you think he ever had any convictions? He was looking for money. What else? <laughs> yeah, exactly. He had a conviction the money would solve problems, right? Yeah. He rules. Well, he probably knew about Paul having brought all this gold. Maybe, yeah, it's possible. What do you think Paul did for two years sitting in that prison? It was a beautiful spot. I, I assume he would have a chance to get out once in a while. And, and if, you, if you visit there, they will show you the the, the, the a pavement of a what they say was a judgment hall, which they believe Paul came and, and uh, gave witness there on several occasions. Beautiful place. Well, we're not quite sure what Paul did, but it's quite possible that during that time, Luke, maybe with the help of Timothy, who was with him much, much of the time, was traveling around Galilee, Judea, and Perea, collecting information he needed and later used to write the Gospel of Luke. Is it possible that God allowed that to happen in order for Luke to be written? Let's, let's just look at the evidence for that. Luke chapter 1, the first four verses. Dear Theophilus, many people have done their best to write a report of the things that have taken place among us. They wrote about what we have been told by those who saw these things from the beginning and who proclaimed the message. And so, Your Excellency, because I have carefully studied all these matters from their beginning, I thought it would be good to write an orderly account for you. I do this so that you will know the full truth about everything which you have been taught. Does that mean he did some careful investigation? Sounds like it. Sounds like it, doesn't it? Yeah. Paul would have had a lot of time to pray, too, during this time, because he was always praying for the churches out there. Do you suppose, you know, I, I try to imagine Luke and Timothy coming back there from time to time and saying, you know, we, we just went to there and we talked to X and X and X, whoever all these other people are, and this is what we heard, and Paul said, wow, that's great, you know. I'm sure that was probably the, some of the best parts of his day, or, or months even, uh, when he got some reports back on the research that Luke was doing, at least that would be my Im impression. Portius Festus became the governor of Judea in AD 59 or 60 and remained until AD 62. When he arrived, Paul was still in prison. Well, look at Acts 25, 1 to 5. And this is a, just another hint about what's going on. Three days after Festus arrived in the province, he went from Caesarea to Jerusalem. And guess what he found What he found when he got to Jerusalem? Where the chief priests and the Jewish leaders brought their charges against Paul. They begged Festus to do them the favor of bringing Paul to Jerusalem, for they had made a plot to kill him on the way. Festus answered, Paul is being kept a prisoner in Caesarea, and I myself will be going back there soon. Let your leaders go to Caesarea with me and accuse the man if he's done anything wrong. Are we thankful that um, he stood up for Roman rights there? Mm -hmm. 
So once again, the leading Jews tried to convince the Roman governor to send Paul to be tried under a Jewish court. Of course, we know that the reason for asking for this was so that they could kill Paul. Festus told the Jews to come to Caesarea Maritima and bring their charges against Paul there. The Jews were not happy about that, but they came anyway. Paul understood exactly what they had in mind, so after responding in the same way he had responded at the earlier trial, he refused to be taken to Jerusalem, realizing it would be a death sentence. Instead, he appealed to the emperor. As a Roman citizen, he had that right. So what do we say, what does it mean when we say appeal to the emperor? Nero, wasn't it, back in Rome? It was Nero, and it, if you're a Roman citizen and you're charged especially with a serious crime, you had the privilege, if you choose to do so, to appeal to, the, to Caesar and, and have your case tried before Caesar. Was that a law that had been there for a long time with Rome? Do we have any idea from extra biblical sources? Uh, we know that the law was there, but I don't know how long, how long it had been there. When it started. Yeah. He basically went over their heads. So yeah. that, yeah. Yeah. Well, Festus had one big problem. What was his problem? There were no valid, reasonable charges against Paul. I mean, you send this guy with a, with a centurion and a bunch of soldiers to escort him to all the way to Rome, and you say, what's wrong? What's the problem here? What, what did he do wrong? Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, what do you do? He believes in something called the resurrection. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But that's Pretty why principle for the Roman mind. That's why he had the excuse, valid excuse, to appeal to Caesar. Mm -hmm. There was nothing they yeah. could prove to be wrong. If they, if there was, they would have taken care of business. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, fortunately for him, he at least <coughs> he thought so. Herod Agrippa II arrived with his sister Bernice to visit him, probably on the occasion of his becoming the new governor of Palestine. What do we know about Herod Agrippa II? Dennis, I think you have something on that. Herod Agrippa II, um, AD 27 or 8 to uh, 92 or 100, officially named Marcus uh, Julius Agrippa and sometimes shortened to Agrippa, was the eighth and last ruler of Judea from the Herodian dynasty. He was the fifth to bear the title of king of the Jews, but in practice he ruled as a uh, Roman client. Agrippa was overthrown by his Jewish subjects in 66 and supported the Roman side of the first Jewish-Roman war. His territory was called uh, Chel, Chelsus. Chelsus, similar to that of Herod Philip. Now, if you remember in the times of Jesus, um, the, well, after Herod the Great died, his kingdom was divided, the, the country was divided into four areas. Judea, uh, and then, um, which Herod was it that, anyway, the, the, the area in, in, in around Jerusalem itself was given to his, his oldest son, who was such a scoundrel, he immediately, upon taking uh, the, the position there, killed 3,000 Jews just to prove who was boss. And so he was, he, they got rid of him right away, and it was on that occasion that they imposed a, a Roman governor for the first time. And that was in prophecy, in Daniel, that's prophesied. We don't have time to go through all that, though. So that's why we end up with a Roman governor in, responsible for Jerusalem. Then the second piece was given to um, another Herod that he and he ruled, and he was the one who who killed John the Baptist. He ruled over Perea on the other side of the Jordan River and Galilee, and then Herod Philip ruled up in the north um, in the area um, north and east of the Sea of Galilee, uh, up into southern part of what would be Syria today, Golan Heights, that part. So that's where Herod Agrippa II here, that was his territory. But he, of course, was a very functionary kind of a guy, just said, I'm, I'm, uh, my allegiance is whoever's the strongest guy around here. And uh, he just caved to the Romans whenever it was appropriate. Well, look at Roman, I mean, Acts 25, starting with 
verse 13. Sometime later, King Agrippa and Bernice came to Caesarea to pay a visit of welcome to Festus. After they had been there several days, Festus explained Paul's situation to the king. There is a man here who was left a prisoner by Felix, and when I went to Jerusalem, the Jewish chief priests and elders brought charges against him and asked me to condemn him. But I told them that we Romans are not in the habit of handing over anyone accused of a crime before he has met his accusers face to face and has had the chance of defending himself against the accusation. That's a very reasonable position, isn't it? When they came here then, I lost no time, but on the very next day I sat in the court and ordered the man to be brought in. His opponents stood up, but they did not accuse him of any of the evil crimes that I thought they would. All they had were some arguments with him about their own religion and about a man named Jesus who has died, and, but Paul claims that he's alive. I was undecided about how I could get information on these matters, so I asked Paul if he would be willing to go to Jerusalem and be tried there on these charges. But Paul appealed. He asked to be kept under guard and let the emperor decide his case. So I gave orders for him to be kept under guard until I could send him to the emperor. Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear this man myself. You will hear him tomorrow, Festus answered. So that's how the next event that we know about took place. Okay, this is Acts 25, 23 to 27. The next day Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and ceremony and entered the audience hall with the military chiefs and the leading men of the city. Festus gave the order and Paul was brought in. Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are here with us, you see this man, against whom all the Jewish people, both here and in Jerusalem, have brought complaints to me? They scream that he should not live any longer. But I could find, not find that he had done anything for which he deserved the death sentence. And since he himself made an appeal to the emperor, I have decided to send him. But I have nothing definite about him to write to the emperor. So I've brought him here before you and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after investigating his case, I may have something to write. For it seems unreasonable to me to send a prisoner without clearly indicating the charges against him. <laughs> it seems, that's a rational thing, isn't it? <laughs> this comes from the Good News Bible. And now, Paul, still manacled, stood before the assembled company. What a contrast was here presented. Agrippa and Bernice possessed power and position, and because of this they were favored by the world. But they were destitute of the traits of character that God esteems. They were transgressors of his law, corrupt in heart and life. Their course of action was abhorred by heaven. And that's from Ellen G. White, The Acts of the Apostles, page 434.3. Have you ever stopped and asked yourself, what if Paul had been one that was judging and Herod Agrippa was the one on trial? <laughs> Think of all the charges that could be brought. You know, how many, we don't even know, I think, how many people of his own family that Herod the Great killed. Oh. And the people, his descendants weren't any better. I mean, we know the story about which one was it? Was it Herod Agrippa the first that, that was made that big he, well, he, first of all, he, he beheaded James, and then he went off to uh, and tried to kill Peter and John. They got away from him. Then he went off and made this thing and tried to claim he was a god, and then he died of this awful disease, and oh, man. Well, Agrippa and his sister Bernice were dressed in royal robes, and there was Paul dressed simply as a prisoner. What a difference in appearance. Well, does appearance really matter when it comes to the need to discover truth? Are we too influenced by the appearance of someone? Well, James, uh, in his uh, letter, addressed that, you know, when if you have a rich person come in and you have another yep. poor, poor person, you know, where do you sit them? And, and uh, how we tend to give preference for the rich in their fine clothing, but uh, tell the poor to, you know, sit yep. over here out of the way. Well, and I, I am always amused. I, I almost never have a chance to watch TV except I catch the news a little bit while I'm eating. But 
if you see one of these terrible criminal, criminals being brought before a judge, and you know that this guy's a real scoundrel, when he shows up in court, what does he look like? Oh, well dressed. Perfect. Up. <laughs> His hair is good. Suit and tie. I don't know who provides it. Yeah, I've yeah I've seen that over and over. It's a regular, on the jury, I've regular seen that. appearance. Oh yes, amazing. Yeah. They clean up. They really clean up. <laughs> wow. Well, going on, going now to Acts chapter twenty-six because we're just basically following the story here. Agrippa said to Paul, "You have permission to speak on your own behalf." Paul stretched out his hand and defended himself as follows. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate that today I am to defend myself before you from all the things these Jews accuse me of, particularly since you know so well all the Jewish customs and disputes. I ask you then to listen to me with patience. All the Jews know that I have lived every, how I have lived ever since I was young. They know how I have spent my whole life, at first in my own country and then in Jerusalem. They have always known, if they are willing to testify, that from the very first I have lived as a member of the strictest party of our religion, the Pharisees. So there's no question about Paul's background here. And now I stand here to be tried because of the hope I have in the promise that God made to our ancestors, the very thing that the twelve tribes of our people hope to receive as they worship God day and night. So you can see he's starting to weave a web here, saying, Look, if you're a real Jew, what do you believe in? The coming of the Messiah, right? Mm -hmm. And it is because of this hope, Your Majesty, that I am being accused by these Jews. Why do you who are here find it impossible to believe that God raises the dead? So Paul is not afraid to raise the, the issue. I myself, thought I, sh I myself thought that I should do everything I could against the cause of Jesus of Nazareth. That is what I did in Jerusalem. I received authority from the chief priests of putting many God's people in prison, and when they were sentenced to death, they also voted against them. Now, why is that verse important? Well, I, I wonder how uh, only, only the Romans had the right to put people to death. I know uh, Stephen was stoned, and they probably got around Ellen that, so. White says they bribed the Roman authorities with a lot of money to overlook that. So if people were being, if he was arresting them or, and uh, people were be putting, being put to death, then there must have been an extension of the corruption there. Well, or did they, did they actually bring them before a Roman court and get away with it somehow or other? Yeah. Well, the reason this is important is I also voted against them. What does that mean? He was part of the Sanhedrin. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. This is the verse that nails down the point that he was a member of the Sanhedrin. In order to be a member of the Sanhedrin, you had to be at least 30 years of age, and you had to be married. This is our evidence that Paul was married, and that he was at least 30 when he, at this point. And that would have been A.D. 34, probably, when this happened. Many times I have been I had them punished in the synagogues and tried to make them deny their faith. I was so furious with them that I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. Well, it was for this purpose that I went to Damascus with authority and orders from the chief priests. It was on the road at midday, Your Majesty, that I saw a light much brighter than the sun coming from the sky and shining around me and the men traveling with me. Now, it's interesting to notice that Damascus was probably a part of King Herod's territory. Okay? Um, all of us fell to the ground, and I heard a voice say to me in Hebrew, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You are hurting yourself by, kicking, by hitting back like an ox kicking against its owner's stick. Who are you, Lord? I asked. And the Lord answered, I am Jesus, whom you persecute. But get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as my servant. You are to tell others what you have seen of me today and what I will show you in the future. So that's evidence that Paul had future visions and revelations from God, right? Mm -hmm. I will rescue you from the people of Israel and from the Gentiles to whom I will send you. 
You are to open the, their eyes and turn them from the darkness of the no light, darkness to the light, and from the power of Satan to God, so that through their faith in me they will have their sins forgiven and receive their place among God's chosen people. And so, King Agrippa, I did not disobey the vision I had from heaven. So you see again, he's another part of the web saying, don't we believe in the prophets? He's going to say that in a few minutes. Where do the prophets get their information? Visions from heaven, right? So Paul now has had a vision from heaven. So I'm a, one of those prophets that you know that we're supposed to believe in. Well, first in Damascus and in Jerusalem and then in all Judea and among the Gentiles I preached that they must repent of their sins and turn to God and do things that would show they had repented. It was for this reason that these Jews seized me while I was in the temple and they tried to kill me. But to this very day I have been helped by God and so I stand here giving my witness to all, to small and great alike, what I say is the very same thing which the prophets of Moses said was going to happen that the Messiah must suffer and be the first one to rise from death to announce the light of salvation to Jews and to Gentiles, and to the Gentiles. As Paul defended himself in, all, in this way, Festus shouted at him, You are mad, Paul! Your great learning is driving you mad! Paul answered, I am not mad, Your Excellency. I am speaking the sober truth. King Agrippa, I can speak to you with all boldness because you know about these things. I am sure that you have taken notice of every one of them, for this thing has not happened hidden, hidden away in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. Now, what's, what's Paul doing here? He's getting him in a corner. <laughs> getting him in a corner. Well, you're a Jew. You claim to believe in the prophets. I'm just quoting you of what we know to be true from the prophets. Right? It's pretty interesting to me to think that he was listened to for that long, and it seems without interruption yeah. as far as what we have. And it was probably a lot longer than this brief account we have here. This is, I'm sure, is just a brief summary. Agrippa said, Paul, in this short time, do you think you will make me a Christian? Whether a short time or a long time, Paul answered, my prayer to God is that you and all the rest of you who are listening to me accept. Uh, today might become what I am, except, of course, for these chains. Then the king, the king, the governor, Bernice, and all the others stood up, and after leaving, they said to each other, This man has not done anything for which he should die or be put in prison. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been released if he had not appealed to the emperor. So now we've got a challenge here. Three people have looked at him. They have evaluated him, and what is their conclusion? He's innocent. He's innocent. And yet he's appealed to Rome. So now what are we going to do? Well, Paul does something very clever in his discussion. He uses expressions like us and our, and what's he doing? <laughs> the royalty. Well, basically he's saying, you know, we're Jews. We should share beliefs. You know what I'm talking about. You can hear him, you know. He's saying, I believe this because I'm a Pharisee. I'm a teacher of others. And what about you, Agrippa? Well, so we have it here. Paul described his life as a former Pharisee and persecuted the Christians. That was the first part of his defense. Then in Acts 26, 12 through 18, he described how his life changed as a result of that bolt of light that hit him on the road to Damascus. And then in Acts 26, 19 to 23, Paul made it clear that, at least in his opinion, he had no choice but to follow the directions given to him by God himself. He had gone to the Gentiles and preached the gospel so as to make them equal partners in the plan of salvation. Well, what, what's interesting here is that Agrippa being in the corner is really in a situation where if he releases Paul to the Jews, he might get killed or he will get killed. Now Agrippa is in trouble with Rome. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, he has appealed to Rome. So now he has no choice but to send him on to Rome mm -hmm. where God had a purpose for him. So why do you think uh, Festus thought it was necessary to Shout, you know, your great learning has made you, got, made you mad. 
He didn't wait for, a, a, I mean, Paul is talking to Agrippa. Why does um, he think he needs to interrupt? Well, it's, it's like Jesus said to Paul on the road, you know, is it hard to kick against the pricks? Mm -hmm. In other words, if you're starting to feel something in your conscience that's drawing you there, uh, your flesh is going to, you know, just get angry and, and uh, react to that, try to shut it down, come up with anything. I, when I think about these experiences, and you've said, heard me say this before, and I would like you out there to think of this too, I try to put myself in that situation. How would I respond? What would I do to sort of really, you know, embed myself, what would you say if someone showed up that you had never seen before, claimed to be inspired or have received a, mes a special message and said, I believe in that people can rise from the dead, and you'd never heard of such a thing ever happening before? Well, if he was a Jew, of course he would have yeah. uh, heard of a few people in the Old Testament rising from the dead. So. Yeah. Yeah, it, true, but it wasn't exactly something that happened often. No. Yeah. Whenever I think about people rising from the dead, I think of that story about Elisha's grave, and they were carrying the, that dead man, and the Moabites showed up, and they, the Moabites were grabbing people and forcing them into slavery and stealing anything they thought was of value. And so here were these people in this funeral procession. They threw the, the, the uh, dead man into Elisha's grave, and they started running off, and when the, when the guy hit Elisha's bones, he came back to life and got himself unwrapped, and he went outside, and there was, there was the Moabites coming full speed, and there's his friends up there running away, and can't you imagine, wait for me! <laughs> Just imagine. <laughs> and they're either, right now. Either that or the Moabites saw him unwrapping and coming from the dead, and they, they, they turned and ran. Ran the other direction, yeah. Well, okay. Finally, Paul talked with King Agrippa, asking the question that had put Agrippa in a very difficult position that we've been discussing. As a Jew, he could not deny that he believed in the scriptures. I mean, you would just, you know, they would say, what kind of a Jew are you? But if he had said yes to Paul's assertions, which he knew were in the Old Testament, he would have had to accept Jesus as the Messiah. So he came up with a clever escape. In this short time, do you think you will make me a Christian? Okay, so what happened next, Jim? King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. And then Agrippa said to Paul, in this short time, do you think you will make me a Christian? Whether a short time or a long time, Paul answered, my prayer to God is that you and all the rest of you who are listening to me today might become what I am, except, of course, for these chains. Then the king, the governor, Bernice, and all the others got up. And after leaving, they said to each other, This man has not done anything for which he should die or be put in prison. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been released if he had not appealed to the emperor. So he's already been in prison for something like two years. Mm -hmm. And there was no, quote, no reason for them to be put in prison. And, you know, in the King James, it says, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. That, in fact, isn't a very good translation. This one that we have here, and uh, you can look at mo more of the modern versions, uh, is a better translation. Um, so, look at this comment. The other, Jim? Did the mind of Agrippa at these words revert to the past history of his family and their fruitless efforts against him whom Paul was preaching? Did he think of his great-grandfather Herod and the massacre of the innocent children of Bethlehem? Of his great-uncle Antipas and the murder of John the Baptist? Of his own father Agrippa I and the martyrdom of the Apostle James? Did he see in these disasters which speedily befell these kings an evidence of the displeasure of God in consequence of their crimes against his servants? Did the pomp and display of his of this day remind Agrippa of the time when his father, a monarch more powerful than he, stood at that same city, excuse me, in that same city, attired in glittering robes, with the people shouted that he was a god. 
Had he forgotten how, even before the admiring shouts had died away, vengeance, swift and terrible, had befallen the vainglorious king? Something of, something of all this fitted across, flitted, excuse me, something of this all flitted across Agrippa's memory, but his vanity was flattered by the brilliant scene before him and pride and self-importance banished all the nobler thoughts. Ellen White's comments, SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 6. Wow. Also from the sketches of, from the life of Paul. So let's just take a second and think about this. How long was it after Herod the Great tried to kill baby Jesus until he died? Oh, not, not, not long, long at all. Not even a year? No. Okay, Herod Antipas, how long did he survive after John the Baptist, after he killed John the Baptist? We don't have precise dating on the, but not very long at all. Now we have Herod, this Herod's father, who beheaded James and tried to kill Peter and John, and then he came out here and claiming to be a god and all this kind of stuff, and I mean, within a week or so, he's dead. You'd, you'd think that someone would say, hmm, this isn't a good... Huh? Something's going on here. <laughs> Something's going on here, right. Well, one of the things that Paul makes clear in all this is that his imprisonment and possible death were less important to him than spreading the gospel. What does that say to us? When it was all over and Paul had been dismissed, the words of Agrippa are telling. He did not see any reason for convicting Paul. But Paul had already appealed to Caesar, and his request had been formally granted. Thus, Paul's jurisdiction was no longer under Festus's control. So we don't know how, exactly how that whole process worked out, but you send a centurion? What, what's, the, what's the position of a centurion? Commander of a hundred. Commander of a hundred people at least, sometimes more. And you're sending him on, by a sh on a ship all the way to Rome just to escort this one prisoner? Who's innocent. Who's innocent. Suppose his soldiers went with him? Well, some must have. I, he, you know, I, I can't believe he went by himself. Yeah. Um, so in all this, what was Paul's appeal? Who was he appealing to? Nero, which is not such a... Okay, appealed to Nero, but he, his strength, his support up. was in what? God. God oh, and oh, the statements yes. from Scripture. I mean, when it came time to provide evidence, where did he quote? He quoted the Scriptures, right? Yeah. Well, well, what do you think now? Was it a mistake for Paul to appeal to Caesar? Well, it was mixed. God said he was going to go there sooner or later. Yeah, he'd already been told by God that Nero he was, was not a man to fool with. Nero wasn't ruthless. Was crazy man. Yeah. That in inspiration may have come from God directly anyway, <coughs> because if he had been released, he would have been killed. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, if, he, if he'd been released in Palestine, yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, probably. If the Jew, for sure, if the Jews found out about it, and I suppose if you, oh, went they would have followed him wherever he goes to kill yeah. him. Yeah. So maybe that was a protection for Paul's life. It was. Well, he apparently was faced with a choice of being taken to Jerusalem, in which case his life would end, probably before he got to Jerusalem, or to be taken to Rome to be tried by the despotic Emperor Nero. And there's, look at Acts 25, 25, and 26, 31, and 32. Did Paul remember at that point the words of God who had told him earlier that someday he would be testifying in Rome? I'm sure those words went through his mind many times in this whole situation. What do you think Agrippa thought when he heard Paul appealing to heavenly visions as justification for his behavior? We don't know much about his background, but uh, the implication is that he's getting his information from God himself, right? Mm -hmm. And the kings, they like to think they're the final word, right? Mm -hmm. and what happens when you now, someone comes along and says, I have authority from a higher power? Well, on that occasion, King Agrippa had the privilege of hearing the gospel directly from the lips of Paul the Apostle himself. Shouldn't he have been persuaded? 
How clear an argument for the gospel could you make to someone that you know? Are there times when it is necessary to defend our own personal history? Uh, do you think Paul should have given a theological discussion from the Old Testament instead of telling his own story? Would that have been more effective? There's, there's pretty good evidence that people like Paul had memorized major parts, if not in the entire Old Testament in Hebrew. So he could have quoted anything he wanted to quote from the Old Testament. Well, remember that you are an expert on your personal history. Do you feel a responsibility for sharing the gospel? Should Christians seriously attempt to defend themselves when they are accused? I mean, we want to be humble and uh, we don't want to stir up too much trouble, but what, at the end, in the time of trouble or before the time of trouble, are we going to just meekly go to our deaths or are we going to, or potential deaths? Or we, or do we have the right to speak up? Should we be st speaking up? I think so. We have opportunity to speak yeah. and uh, that would be a chance to I, witness. I have looked at, yeah. As you weave that in. I have looked at the, what Ellen White says about this quite extensively, and I think a lot of people are going to hear about the Sabbath and about the truths of the gospel from the testimony that's published in, in, in maybe TV, radio, television, whatever, uh, I mean, uh, even newspapers, reports of people who will give, be giving, giving their testimony in court. I really think that may be true. Well, here's a question for you out there. If you were on trial for being a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Well, in our day, among the nominally Christian churches, there is a great emphasis on love and getting along with other Christians. In that context, is there sufficient reason for standing up for what we believe in opposition to what others believe? You know that there's a great push these days. Well, you know, why, let's, let's just set aside our differences. Why, why can't we all just, and for, of course, the, the, the Pope and his associates there saying, we're the Mother Church, just, just come back and rejoin us. We Christians are all supposed to love each other. Why do we need to get all riled up about some minor differences? Let's forget the differences. Let's just come together. Well, should we be doing that? And you know that the day is coming when if we insist on our differences, we're going to be called bigots. Yeah, but some of those differences are quite important. I, I see this situation sometimes where you might want to speak out about it. Mm -hmm. Well, we know that Christianity is being attacked from every side in our day. Mm -hmm. Questions are being asked like, are you pro-life? Do you want prayer in schools? And you've probably heard the response of students when they say, ask whether there's prayer, every, whether they can eliminate prayer from schools. And one student said, so long as there are tests, there will be prayer in schools. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a good response. Shouldn't our science curriculums include intelligent design? Well, are these political issues things that we should be standing up for and about which we should be writing to our congresspersons? When faced with such questions, do we need to turn the conversation to Jesus? Are we allowed to do that? Well, we've seen that Paul gave three different defenses, which in Greek are called apologia, on those occasions before Felix, Festus, and then King Agrippa II. Clearly, Paul gave a convincing argument against all the accusations that the Jews were able to bring. Shouldn't he have been allowed to go free? Why wasn't he allowed? Well, we've already discussed that. We know that Felix called Paul in to talk with him on several occasions, hoping that Paul would bring him a bribe to earn his freedom. What do you think Paul said on those occasions? Whatever he had opportunity to say. Yeah, more of the same. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. You think uh, Felix ever specifically said, you know, just, just bring me a good dose of gold and I'll let you out? Probably well, not. Probably not. Maybe he implied it. Well, I'm sure he implied right, it. Right, yeah. but, but right, uh, yeah, he would. Direct question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, shouldn't the Jews in Jerusalem who had received that enormous offering that Paul and his friends had brought, 
shouldn't they have been willing to bring a little something to get Paul out of prison? Would it be morally wrong to take a little bit of the gold that Paul had brought and give it to Felix to get Paul out of prison? Hmm. I think so. You think it would be? Yeah. It's the thin end of the wedge. You're on the downward trail. You didn't do that. <laughs> Well, freeing Paul from prison so he'd go out and spread the gospel, wouldn't that be a good idea? I think God has better ways than that. Why do you think Paul appealed to Caesar at the point when he, which he did? He could have appealed to Caesar, Caesar right back in the beginning. Well, it appeared that they were going to take him back to Jerusalem, and yeah. he, he knew what would happen then, so this yeah. was his, his way out of that. He probably spent a lot of time thinking about that because obviously he knew what his rights were. Thinking about, okay, what happens if I have to stand up again? What happens if this and that and the other? And he, I'm sure he was a Pharisee. He had been a member of the Sanhedrin. I'm sure he understood that they, they wanted to take him back to Jerusalem. He must have thought that whole thing through very clearly. Wasn't there a nephew or somebody that uh, mm -hmm. warned him? See? Yeah. About that was the midnight ride when yeah. he yeah. escaped Jerusalem the first yeah. time. That's how he got to Caesarea Maritima. Well, Agrippa and his sister Bernice heard the arguments of Paul in light of what we know about these two. There are some scholars who believe that they had an incestuous love affair. Do you think they would have been likely to be persuaded by Paul? No doubt Paul knew about some of the evils that had been perpetrated by the Herodian family in the past. Should he have mentioned some of those in his discussion? Well, what do you think of Paul's general response to such questions by telling his personal story? Is that a good way to go? Mm -hmm. If we are questioned, should we do the same? If you were not a Seventh-day Adventist Christian earlier in your life, what could you tell about your conversion story that might be convincing to others? Would it be a good idea for us to practice developing a defense that we could use if necessary? I mean, Paul sat in prison for two years probably thinking about his defense. We're not sitting in prison, but that day may come. Should we, should we be prepared for such an event? Or so we're just going to wait and when the moment comes, we'll figure out what to say. We're running out of time, so I, I guess... If we're listening to God, that would be the best thing we can do. Yeah. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for the privilege we have of coming together like this and talking about your word. We think about Paul now and the events which uh, brought, well, came about near the end of his life. We know there's still some years to go, but all this time in prison must have been very frustrating to him. Help us to know what we can learn from this and how we can be prepared as he definitely was when the time comes for us to stand up for the truth that we believe is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.